And there was this little grandma, and literally grandma, I'm not like <laughs> trying to be mean. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I just got blinded by a rigid light bar <laughs> uh, here in the Rugged Radio's Off-Road Syndicate trailer here at UTV Takeover, Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, if you follow the podcast and the channel, you know every year I like to come down and make a, make a visit and do some podcasts with some interesting people here at the show that don't normally get access to around the country. So uh, today we're joined by a special guest, uh, somebody that uh, has really been in the racing scene pretty hardcore the last few years um, and uh, has been racing primarily Polaris cars and, and things like that. And the first time I think I saw uh, our guest, uh, he was racing uh, RS1. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and today he's racing uh, full-on Turbo Pro XPs and things like that. So welcome to the show, Jake Versi. How are you doing? Good, good. Appreciate it. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to be here. I'm stoked. And uh, UTV Takeover is an awesome event. So this is this is a rad place to, to hook up with you guys. Yeah, and you, uh, you were here last year, right? Like you came out and, and ripped with the guys? Yep. This is our third year here, and uh, we're we're a little bit of a journey away and it's well worth it so <laughs> yeah we'll uh we'll be to all of the utv takeovers in oregon it's awesome so you um you are southern idaho right you're a southern idaho boy yep idaho falls yeah there's a lot of good brands down there you got a lot of good yeah. manufacturing going on down there yeah yep there's like climb uh boondocker a couple you other got sector seven pro yeah, you got, yep. um shoot you got a bunch of guys down there you got isn't um factor 55 down there or something like that yeah out in uh by boise yeah yeah, yeah. so there's a lot of good brands out there we got our our northwest group is all located down in southern idaho like <laughs> <laughs> you go to utah arizona and to california they're all down south west, southwest down yeah, there yeah yep you know and, and they all stick to each other's products we, we like to stick to ours up in right northwest. right <laughs> so oh, that's awesome so uh yeah so you race primarily the ultra four circuit right yeah yep ultra four um and then we've done a couple other like polaris involved events but ultra four is really what we're chasing that's where we're chasing championships and uh that's kind of where our the car that i've built the the cars have all been catered to ultra four where you can rock race it's a real it's a big difference between being able to hit rocks and all the other racing so yeah there's definitely a, a completely different mindset when you're doing short yeah. course just the the soft dirt flat dirt little yep. jumps kickers uh and a little different when you have to c account for uh Part failures. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the whole deal. And Ultra 4 is uh, whose car gets to the end the fastest <laughs> right. is, uh, is definitely the winner. So, like I said, the first time I saw you, you were racing an RS1 uh, back in the day. Was that short course then? Um, no, I built that car to be uh, Ultra 4 short course. Uh, the whole premise behind, behind that was to build a super tough car with HDR suspension and all, all that, but have it be lightweight still. Right. And uh, actually, a couple of the guys in Ultra 4 right now are campaigning uh, highly modified single-seaters, and they're doing well in it. It's yeah, the... Uh I saw that Travis uh, Zollinger guy uh, yep. racing his X3 modified. Yep. That thing was at, down at the Mint, and that was pretty sweet. Yeah, um, very nice car. And his is a complete concept car. Like. <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> but, uh, no, I've always uh, dug the single seats, and I think we were talking yesterday about my, my desire to build a you know a, a yep. missile on wheels out of one of those things. Oh, yeah. So. They're a riot. Um, and uh, so you, you started in the RS. Did you start in the RS1, or did you start previous to that? No. So my racing, I've always been, to UT, been into UTVs, and uh, being from southeast idaho st anthony sand dunes is kind of where we found the love for uh for for bigger machines in 2014 we bought a xp 1000 and that was a ton of fun um and then i started uh riding with travis zollinger at, Z at okay. zollinger racing products and uh, he had offered me a job and i'm like no man i'm happy and uh <laughs> what, were you, what were you doing at the time i was working at a nuclear facility uh nuclear cleanup Frickin project nuclear scientist on the <laughs> show <laughs> no, folks no. you heard it here first yeah it was a garbage cleanup plant no but uh <laughs> well that's every nuclear website yeah <laughs> no so it was a, it's a great job i was happy with it um but travis invited us to a couple of races king of hammers being one of them uh we were at glenn hallen was one of them so i i came down to this funny deal where um, if I wanted to keep going to the races, I had to go work for him. So I was in this super <laughs> tough position. He knew um, what he was doing. Oh, yeah, he, he 100% <laughs> did. So, no, he had an extra razor, and he had kind of built another Can-Am. So he's like, well, I have a spare car. You can drive it. And uh, uh, obviously I, I accepted that. And uh, I raced with them for two years. I went to work for him and raced with him for two years. So it was a little bit – I was 150 miles from Logan, and I commuted uh, every day to you Logan. You 150 back. miles to work every day? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's the that's the sacrifice. Well, that's kind of like a racing. nuclear job, so <laughs> you don't live <laughs> yeah. next to it. <laughs> right. No, it was awesome. So the 
my first race car was uh, a Zonda Racing Products built Razor Turbo. A okay, yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah. Yep. So that was the big ZRP car. Yep. And because was Travis racing at that time, or was he just? He was. Yeah. Okay. In a Can Am. In a Can Am. Yeah. Yep. And he's pretty much been on a Can Am since then too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think he prefers just like the seating position and the yeah. power and all of it. They're yeah. awesome cars. No, for sure. And, and yeah. they've they've really been proving themselves over the last couple of years. Yep. Um, but uh, so you've been racing. So you, the RS One's not a turbo. So you're racing NA back yeah, then yeah so i built that car and uh i actually had plans to turbo it to race in ultra four and it sounds bad it's kind of a first world problem but in ultra four is so violent that uh the need for a backup race car yeah. is pretty high <laughs> <laughs> so if you you know you run into an issue out pre-running or uh i mean you, you got to race the car you qualify in but right there's a, a few guys that have extra cars, and it's worth it. So it was yeah. a backup race car. Yeah, gotcha. And then you moved into the turbo. And so did you go just uh, like stock turbo or pro mod, or uh, how did you go into that? Ultra 4, up until this last year, was just 4,900 UTV, which right. was unlimited. Uh, turbos raced with the NAs, uh, superchargers. They were all lumped together. Gotcha. Um, with the in the last year they've switched it out it has like three or four classes right, now right. um anyway there's some growing pains to that i think it'll be a good thing i, I would love to see an na versus turbo class but there's a there's a few well, more there's the open there. right like that's kind of where they're lumping everybody in yeah so like a full tube chassis car it's kind of it's similar to best in the desert where uh you know what plastics you're running dictate your class whether you have a turbo or not dictate your class tire size is another one the goal i believe was to get more racers coming in that were like well i don't have you know a hundred thousand right. dollar budget uh so there was Which is the whole concept of utv racing like that's why it's exploding yeah. right yeah people aren't spending a hundred grand they're spending a base amount and then working yep. their way up as they move into the series or into the season or whatever yeah um, yep. so when you were racing uh the consolidated class what do you see different between then and now when you have your your more defined classes? What's what as a racer like? What what are you what are you seeing different? And how does it feel different as a racer? Um, to be honest, I'm a, I'm for the uh, the one class <laughs> run what you brung. That was kind of what Ultra Four was about. Um, it's a, it, a little bit diluted, but like I said, that's kind of where the growing pains are. I think that we'll see a point that all the classes make sense. Um, right now, it's still like unclear where you know each person's car and you know you build a hundred thousand dollar car uh race utv and you used to be able to race all together and now you're stuck in a class that maybe only has three entries right um so, so that's a, your your options are limited on where you can race how often you can yeah, race, things like that. yeah so it's, like i said it's just growing pains i think it'll be worked out within the next year that everyone will kind of have a path forward on the class they want to run and then the car counts will come up so one thing that was interesting the last race, desert race that I was at was the Mint, and seeing how how competitive the UTVs are with the trophy trucks, yeah. you know, talking about the price point of these races, right? Yep. Like you were talking about where people were spending half a million dollars on trucks yep. versus now a, a sub hundred thousand dollar car, right? And and being competitive and sometimes outpacing them. Yep. Um, and uh, is that does that impact the Ultra Four kind of like community of racers? Like, is that impacting you on how you make your decisions on what class you're going to be in? Uh, a little bit. I mean, so I purchased a new Polaris Pro R, and I was really excited to race it, and that was one of the growing pains. Uh, Ultra 4 ultimately elected to put the Pro R in the 4400 class for the same trophy. Right. Um, so I ended up selling the car because I couldn't race it. Um, I just, I mean, you're going against a... And it's a big transition for you, right? Yeah. Your whole development has been around. The whole program has been developed around that platform, that yeah. car, that ser that series of racing, yep. and to jump into something bigger. A lot of people don't realize how much oh, yeah, investment of time, resources, tooling, everything yeah. that goes into your car and your program. Yeah, hundred percent. So, the uh, I don't know the the market. It's all moving super fast. The development. I mean, just two years ago at Hammers, it was people were him and Han. Who's gonna run 35s and who's not? Right. And uh, I mean, and then we all know who won with 35s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then this year, if you didn't have 35s, you you were pretty well counted out to yeah. not be on the podium. Right. And that's crazy. I mean, people people do focus so much on the actual car itself, like what model, what what yeah. engine, what horsepower. And there's so much more to that. And a lot of people that are interested or getting started in racing are starting to learn some of that going into this. They're not having to go through some of the growing pains with yeah. alongside the industry. They're jumping straight into right. the industry saying, hey, we're already at a different bar. Yeah, 100%. It's just like we're in the infancy. You go to like a spec TT. I mean, 
you could go buy a competitive truck that's just brand new today and you've never raced anything. Right. So like yeah. it's actually a thing that you can buy where yeah. it didn't used to exist like that. Yeah, UTVs are getting closer to that. Now you can uh there's a ton of killer shops that are building turnkey front running race cars. Right. And we're seeing even just high level racers and shops actually partaking in that purchase because yeah. it saves them their whole team saves them time yep and that's the biggest thing that i've noticed over this last race season that i've I, and i'll be the first to admit i'm not like super educated in racing i'm not a big super hardcore race nerd but i've been noticing the teams and the and the and, and the companies that are investing in this are like hey we we can save so much man hours yeah. just by relying on people we trust yep. and to build us the chassis, the car, the whatever, yep. and bringing in their flavor to that mix once they've acquired that purchase. And it saves them a, it, time's the most expensive part of all uh, this. I mean, yep. you, you know as well as any other racer that you, you're you're wrenching until the day you, you race, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and in between breaks on racing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, is that something that you've considered, you know, how you change your program and how you approach the next season and maybe – modifying into a different class or anything like that do you do you approach it differently now thinking that we're at this stage in our industry that there's different ways to approach financially and sponsor wise yeah right yeah. I and mean, sponsors themselves have different ways of integrating yeah yeah a little bit i think i think what gets you to that level is just the uh, level of support that you have and and your own funding to your race team um, I mean, uh, you know, that's why UTV racing has done so well, because you could just go buy one. You could even finance it and then build it yourself and get into racing. Right. Um, anyway, the the board of how many cars are available is massive. So um, what t to your question on would you buy like a CT Raceworks car? Right, right. I think it's all just your budget, what you what you can and can't do. And obviously, you know, saving money. And time is well <laughs> worth it, but not everyone's got the money. So. Right? No, it's 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 definitely a, a, a scale in the yeah, sport, right? Yeah. Like everybody's at their own point. Yeah. And uh, and unfortunately, you know, the, there are some established guys that yeah. that run hard and win a lot. And, yep. But that's part of racing, right? That's For part sure. of what you're doing as a racer and growing your your team and your experience. Yep. Um, you know, speaking of experience, going through the last, you know, you said you started racing early on in the in our industry's timeline. Yeah. Um, yep. And you've come through some of the growth of getting the turbo cars introduced, getting yep. um, the suspension upgrades that all came out within the last four or five years. Yeah, the live and, uh Seeing shocks go from 2.0 to 3.0, yeah. you know. And then you see, you know, some other manufacturers out there that don't have cars out yet that have like three fives and like, <laughs> right, you know, right. stuff that's going to be showing up to, uh, to the race scene. So uh, kind of what's your what what was your take on on some of that growth over the last five years and how's that impacted your program? I think it's awesome. So I jumped on live valve with Fox. I uh, am fortunate enough to work with Fox Factory um, on the suspension side. And uh, the live valve is game changing. Um, so you're so there are some racers that say I'm not going to run electronic shocks in a race. Right. And then there's some guys who are Definitely. like, it, it changed the game for me. I have yeah, to use it. So, and I think on that is just the level of support you have. I mean, there's a you could have the best shocks. Um, and if you don't have the support to tune those shocks and get them dialed in, right. they're, they're really not, not great. So. Yeah, out of the box, they're meant for a consumer, right? Yeah. And so you, you definitely have to go through that, that, that tuning process. Yep. And something that I've noticed with like even the last year with Fox is that they've been way more involved with getting out into the actual like desert or out into the racetracks yep, and exactly. getting on site to get the tuning done ahead of time for yep. the racers, right? Yep. And I think that's kind of the the big um, put the big change in the sponsorship, the bit the the manufacturing side is they're getting way more interested in being on site to get each yeah. team dialed in. A hundred percent. And I think that's even more um, valuable than just getting the product from the sponsor, right? It's yeah. Participation with that sponsor. Uh, definitely. A set of shocks is your cheapest portion of uh, of of your shock program. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the support beyond the shock sale is is. A hundred percent. Where where and just knowledge, on. right? Yeah. Like if you're going out and and you're in the in the seat, right, it, doing a hot lap, right? Yep. yep. You you can feel something and you can translate it to somebody that says exactly. this is exactly what you're talking about. Yep. I can adjust that. And there's also the guy that's watching you go around the track saying you don't realize that your wheel is doing this in that corner. Exactly. Let's fix that. Yep. And so uh, the the Fox program is definitely something that's taken off, and they've 
you know, they've made some investments recently with some other companies. Yeah, that we're yep. going to see some some big changes on on board. I would assume in the next race season. I'm sure. Um, yes. And uh, and and so uh, I'm always looking for competition, like in the industry, right? Like I'm wondering who's going to come up and, and, and compete with right. them on that level, and right. and and it's bound to happen. Someone's going yeah. to have to step up and say we we're going to have a competitive product. And uh, we just recently saw Bilstein come into the market. Yeah. And with some shocks. And yep. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, I even I even saw Olin's is uh, is kind of trying seeing where they fit in. Right. Well, so. I mean, it's such a big uh, the growth, right? When they yeah. see any big company sees explosive growth, yeah. they're going to say, "Where where's my part of that?" Right. Right. Um, but for the consumer, you know, we always say racing develops the consumer product, sure. right? Uh, and we've seen that with Live Valve. We've seen that with, you know, that came down from the trucks, right? Like it started there and worked its way into UTV. Yep. And, uh, it, seeing how that's progressed, even into consumer cars, you can go buy a Raptor or something that has Live yeah. Valve, right? Yep. Um, so it's interesting to see how that's being evolved and how our industry is playing a bigger role in kind of the broader yeah. the broader market. All of off, yeah, in all of I mean, off-road. shoot, we see talents on Honda commercials now. like <laughs> <in the> Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. no doubt. Um, so what gets you excited on the racetrack? What what are some of your favorite racetracks that you've been doing with Ultra 4? Where's your where's your like money hole that you want to go race every weekend? Yeah, so everybody loves King of the Hammers. It's it's its own deal. Well, well love and hate. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I uh, currently not love. No. It's uh that's a that's a special race for everybody. Um but aside from that, like just ridiculously fun tracks. I've had a blast at Crandon. Um, that seems to be a popular spot. Oh man, it's just like the fans, the way they lay it all out, and the the atmosphere, the experience. Um, and then on top of that, the driving is like second to none. It they really do a, is a they, blast. From everyone I've talked to, they always compliment the race track. Uh, the maintainers of the racetrack. Yeah, yeah. That, that it's not you're going into a race weekend knowing that you're going to throw all your hubs and ball joints and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's predictable, so you can bring your best weapon and know you know exactly how you need to set it up, so that when everybody goes out on track, you're racing each other. You're not racing, you know. So you're not so. racing the track. Yeah. So or like you know, one guy has a car that's so much faster or so much better set up. It levels the playing field when you have a predictable racetrack. Right. And I could definitely see that. I mean, every racer has their own like thing that they, they lock into what makes them excited to get out on the track. Sure. Uh, but the more times than not, it's, it's the attitude of, I want to be racing the best so that I can yes. prove I'm the best. Right. Yep. Yep. And a lot of times that comes down to the driver, not the car, not the technology sure. you know, and all that. Um, so when we talk about hammers, you know, uh, run, running a Polaris, um, the Pro XP came out. How did that change your program from being on the XP platform and 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 how that car handled and rigidity and toughness? And yeah. All that? So the uh, I went from a turbo XP turbo to a Pro XP, and it was um, like mind blowing difference. The right. the live valve technology in the Pro XP is superior. You know, your differentials are bigger. You have the ability to upgrade to even better axles. Um, I mean, it just the our lap times um, at all races pretty much are there's five classes in ultra four <clears throat> and UTVs are we are up to fifth place in the premier 4400 class okay. at every race right I mean, it's unbelievable right. especially over the last couple of years right yeah. yeah so so you were able to see a noticeable difference in in the performance of the car very much outside of the handling and, and the, the upgrades that you do yep the platform itself pro proved itself right away yeah yeah definitely but and like there's an answer to it, it, it you know razor you know has more horsepower more suspension can am is immediately you know <laughs> there's no like there's no clear leader right i mean there's uh, which is good because yeah it, it, at one point it was that way sure when polaris came out with their turbo yeah you know before before the maverick hit the scene and yep. proved itself yep it was really just the polaris racing yeah right for sure and and talking about competition in the industry canon came in and said hold my beer we're here to stay oh, yeah they did and, a great uh, job as well <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're they're they've proven themselves over the last sure. uh, four years um and and now we're seeing these cars that are being competitive uh, across all the all the race programs and all the race series yep. and all the race classes and, and all, all that. So um, it's super interesting to see, you know, the transition from, like, we're out here at the dunes, and these cars, you're like, oh, yeah, everybody buys their car. They put the bolt-ons. They put the cage on. But, no, like, the, the consumer market's now, like, running 300 horse, 400 yeah. horse. Like, it's not uncommon. It's not, it's not uncommon like it used to no, be. No, yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah, I was with. I mean, that we were riding with a couple 400 horsepower can amps, carbon fiber bodies, and they they don't race at all. It's it's super cool. Yeah, and 
and in more and more, I'm starting to see the consumer partake partaking participating in in the racing as like a pit crew helper or yeah. uh, or whatever and they're getting that itch while they're out there with their buddies unfortunately and then <laughs> <laughs> it hits their pocketbook pretty fast yeah uh and uh but but they're they're taking that technology they're taking those tunes they're taking those yeah. upgrades to the consumer side yeah. and and influencing the purchasing habits of all the other people yeah like you come out here to take over right and everyone's out having a good time they'll go hit the beach they'll you know go carve around or whatever go back to camp and then some guy will come out with a with a 400 stroker uh-huh. and, and then all of a sudden every single guy's on his phone like oh how's that how much, <laughs> that, how much is that oh, okay yeah. yeah i already did the same thing uh <laughs> brandon twitcher with hdr has a re- ridiculous rockford stereo in his ranger and now yeah. i gotta buy one yeah exactly <laughs> there's something about when you have a high quality product that performs yeah. to the level of like kind of where your mindset is like oh, yep. well if it hits that that threshold maybe i'll be interested correct yep. and then it blows it out of the water and i you're know just like and there's always something if you just <laughs> if you just look around enough you'll find all the things you need <laughs> especially at a show like this when right. you have everybody bringing their parts down and uh, but uh, speaking of uh, Brandon, we, we got the chance to go on the industry ride last night and uh, go rip the dunes out to the beach and all that. And I got to ride in the front of his uh, new Pro, uh, Pro R4. And, yeah. Uh, How got, was the ride in that? So I was. So here's the thing, right? Passenger, right? That's that's the first problem to get yeah, over. Yeah. And there was four people in it. And so <laughs> we. So I'm not a small dude. Like I'm. I'm. Not, I'll just be honest. Sure. I'm, I'm a water buffalo. So putting that much weight up front on the passenger side where you normally yeah. as a driver would throw harder into the passenger right. side, right? And then we had two gals in the back seat too that were on like just passengers that we picked up. Sure. So it was a fully loaded car. I don't think he has any big upgrades on the shocks. I think they're pretty much stock. Yeah, I believe so. And and so they're running the live valve shocks. Uh, and then they got the new HDR long travel suspension right. on it. And looks awesome. It's a, it's a big bright red car to match all the yeah. other big, r- bright red cars he's got. Um, and uh, but as a passenger, I'm used to getting in the seat, strapping the harness down tight, and then <laughs> making sure I have enough room to pull my back off the seat so when yeah. we bottom out that I'm, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> yep. And so the first couple minutes of the ride, I totally forgot my goggles and my everything, and I was just sitting there trying to protect my face from the roots of all the cars. <laughs> but at the same time, the first few minutes, I'm like, okay, my back's going to go, my back's going to go, I'm gonna, we're going to bottom out because we're a fully loaded car, sure. untested, this yeah. and that, and, and having no idea. And that car just floated like a Cadillac. So cool. And he was he was throwing that thing in the in this drifts and slides and, and carving and, and overtaking other cars and, and all that stuff. And, and never, I think we bottomed out once, and it wasn't a bottom out. It was just the nature of like the shape of the dune hit yeah. the bottom of the car. Yeah. And it was in a whoop section and all that. And it, it didn't even hurt. Like it was just kind of a, oh, yeah, you hit that. So that Pro R is definitely, I don't think he ever had a chance. We were we had what about 50, 60 cars, something like that. Yeah, there was a bunch. And so we were running hard to try to get back up to the front. And I don't think at, at any point that car was pinned full to, to overtake like it, it never had to try hard to yeah, get get up yeah. to speed, right? Yeah. Like he's, as soon as he put his foot into it, that motor was at at mid band and, and angry. Yeah. So it's incredible. Like like you were saying, the progression of of the sport. Uh, one year ago, if you put four four people in a four seater, right. you were you know you lifting at every every transition. You were yep. bottoming out. I mean, yep. it's unbelievable. The, well, that, the we were out here last carry. year with a pro in a pro X before with a full suspension package yeah. and everything, and we were hitting bottom all the time. Yep. And yep. it's not that the package was bad or wrong. It was just that much weight. Yeah. That with that much suspension travel, you're yep. like you're just gonna hit. Yep. And on that Pro R4, uh, it never, it never even like I have a video on my phone where I was holding it out on the <laughs> suspension, trying to get his arms in the shot. Yeah. And they just never look, looked like they even tried. They were just yeah, kind of just crazy. So no, I'm totally, totally impressed. I'm super stoked. Um, our buddy uh, Billy Slade's got a full build. Uh, with the new HDR suspension and everything. Yeah, that's a beautiful and car. And it's, it's an awesome-looking car. I'm going to go do a video on that car. Um, but I, I can't wait to see what that two-seater feels like because, I mean, coming from a, a Pro XP, which was already longer than an XP turbo, right? Right. I yep. can't imagine you know that being much different than a four-seater in the way that it feels when you drive. Uh, I've heard a few people say that when you ride the two-seater Pro Rs that you kind of – or the four-seaters, that the two-seater and the four-seater feel the same, just – you're able to throw the four further out. Interesting. So I actually uh, had a Pro R two seater. Yeah. I had a launch edition, um, and I used it for all of my pre running and King of the Hammers. So I did about 300 miles on it uh, in the desert, and that car is unbelievable. So mine was a two seater, but uh, in the whoops, like 
the bumps that it will eat without unloading and swapping the car right. is mind blowing. I mean, it's the length of it, the suspension setup, it's crazy. Like, and I was talking to Billy. I was like, is did they lengthen the trailing arms on that? And he's like, no, that's the stock length. Yeah, and stock I was like, length. It, it really is something that you don't. You don't understand how much of the geometry change has happened yeah. unless you're like next to it. Right. Yeah. And and even that have it next to another car. Right. Yeah. It's the the level has been raised. Super excited to see what you know what the other what the other brands come out with to compete with it. And a lot of the times people don't realize a lot of the the way your car handles is in the back end suspension. Yep. And you know throwing throwing bigger shocks on it isn't necessarily a fix a lot of times, especially on different brand cars like like the Talons yeah. or the YXZs. Or, like, right. you, you gotta, you got to do more than that. you got to lengthen, stretch, change the geometry yep. of these cars. And uh, and the, the, the Pro R's and the Turbo R, for that matter, are, are such a, a unique, they're almost at the four the four seater length they're just right, right almost there right. and i think that's kind of the the point of that car is that polaris is like hey everybody wants to be a racer whether they're racing or not <laughs> yeah let's give them all a race car <laughs> <laughs> yeah they did <laughs> yeah so super stoked on that i think it'll be a good it, it'll be interesting to see how it progresses and sure and if they come out with a turbo version or, and, right you know and all that stuff we've got some rumors on the mill of of different things coming out from them yeah. uh and then the, obviously the comp competition's always going to be there with more horsepower or yeah. whatever. So um, I think it's only going to be a matter of time before we see dual clutch coming into the right. game and, and seeing how that changes uh, the racing. I think that's kind of been, for me, one of the interesting points is how would a dual clutch class do compared to where it's been? Right. You know, where you're not worried about the power band on a, on a belt and temperatures and things yeah. like that, right? Well, Mitch Guthrie uh, has been putting some impressive – of impressive races down in his pro R versus, you know, spec TTs and even full right. blown TTs. I mean, it's, yeah. It's so impressive. what do you, so what do you think? There's, there's this argument that I keep hearing about, you know, people saying that the UTV should be completely isolated from the TTs and we should keep our classes clean and, and, you know, um, honest to what they are versus what kind of merging them. In. Yep. And you come from a background where you're saying, I like the big classes of everybody. Well, yeah. I like the big class of UTVs, right? So my deal all comes down to weight you know, uh, I want to see similarly weighted vehicles and similarly, you know, top speed. So I am not a fan of putting a UTV with class 10s, class 1s, right. um, or TTs. I, I think they can do it, and I think it's going to be competitive. But the big the big thing that you have to get over is tire size. So a 39, 40-inch tire, you know, compared to our UTV on a 35, I mean, they have to be nice to us, and we really can't do much to them. So right. that's not really great racing. I mean, you should be in like vehicles. Yeah, you shouldn't, um, on the you shouldn't have to be making way for them to race sure. alongside of you. Of you course. should be racing with them. Yep, yep. So I, yeah, I don't, I'll, although I think that they can be competitive, I don't think that it's a safe move. I certainly don't want to do it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, hopefully they keep it separate. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we've seen over the last year or so a number of big spectacular crashes on the race course in the dust. Yeah. Um, you know, and I mean, you know, I was talking to somebody about shock therapy is a big thing with the, with the running into the cow. That's right. Uh, you yep. know, it's like, you never know exactly what's going to happen. And, sure. and you could go through a dust cloud or a silt puddle or something and, and just come straight into, or I should say a bigger truck comes straight into yeah. you and your, your days, you're not going to be ending well. So, yeah. So that's actually coming from the race world. I kind of hear about those accidents and they have been happening. Yeah. Um, you know they're not they're not super publicized, but it it has well, been happening because it's not the race series fault. It's sure. it's just nature, right? Like right. you can't control the wind, right? But yeah, it, I, I don't think I don't think um, I think the consensus is is that the racers don't want to merge. They don't want to be. I certainly hope so. They don't <laughs> want to be also the the prick on the race course that's right. holding up you know half a dozen cars or yeah. whatever. And because a lot of those places you can't turn out, you know you're in right. canyons or whatever. Yep. Um, but, uh, but I, I consistently see kind of like the marketing of, of these cars and, and some of that pushing us towards that. Like, you know, we're, we're building bigger cars cause we want to be those trucks, yeah. you know? And I, I think it's kind of a dangerous balance of like, if you're pushing the industry that way, maybe. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a growing pain though. Maybe, right. you know, in well, the I next, mean, it's just like the pro R, right? Like, every, yeah. It's just a bunch of pro R's racing against each other. Yeah. In the next couple of years, we might see a car from Can-Am, Polaris, whoever that is competitive in class 10 and is similarly weighted. Uh, right. You know, and that's an appropriate class. So, yeah, you just never know. 
Yeah. So, uh, so just to kind of move the subject along, we're in Coos Bay. What um, you said you've been here. This is the third year you've been here. Yep. Um, you're from Southern Idaho, where you have St. Anthony's. Yeah. Right. Yep. And um, how does in uh, just for the consumers that, that consume this podcast, uh, right. what are some of the differences between the dunes out here in, in Coos Bay and Winchester versus like St. Anthony's versus like Glamis? Yeah. So uh, St. Anthony Sand Dunes is huge dunes where if you had 500 horsepower, you'd still wish you had a couple more. Um, you know, tires certainly make a difference there. Um, it's just really high speed, big dunes that you can, you know, go flat out as long as you can. Where uh, here in Oregon, the the draw that I think is super spectacular is like riding through the tree trails are, uh, are a riot. The opportunity to drive out to the ocean in your side by side is is not available in very many places. So that's super cool here. Um, and then, you know, Oregon has the dune section through the middle that's a bunch of fun. I mean, there's just a bunch of diverse terrain Diversity, here. right? Yeah, that, like, would keep anybody happy. I mean, there's everything here but rock crawling, so. Right. <laughs> well, and, and the interesting thing is you can go to here at Coos Bay and have one experience. You can go over to Winchester yeah. and have a completely different experience where you have, like, a hybrid between St. Anthony's and Coos, where right. it's like you got bigger dunes, bigger bowls. Yeah, I haven't actually been there. I need to get up you there. You haven't been to Winchester? No, not yet. Uh, as somebody who has partaked a few times out here, I would say Winchester is the place to be, especially when you're coming from St. Very Anthony's. Very cool. Okay. Uh, the sand's even just a little bit different, even though they're connected. Like, sure. Even though they're, like, right next to each other. Right. Um, they are a little bit different. And, and uh, the nice thing about Winchester is you can do the bowl to bowl. Yeah. But you can also just go straight up. That's right? so cool. And out here at Coos, they're all fairly mellow. Like right. they're, they're only ever, what, 100 feet maybe? <laughs> sure. So you go to Winchester, you could have two, 300 foot you know, faces depending on, on how the wind That's going. awesome. So uh, the only thing about Winchester is you have a lot more witch eyes to worry about. Okay. And so uh, depending on the sun glare and stuff, you might not see them. Uh, so Good there's now. usually more wrecks out there, but, uh, out here at Coos, it's kind of like a, anybody can come out, any family can have yeah. fun and enjoy it. And then the scenery I think is one of the biggest draws so out here. Cool. You know, you go right? to St. Anthony's, you go on top of the dunes. You're like, wow, this is awesome. I can see forever. Yeah. You know, you come out here and it's like, yeah, I can see the beach. I can see the mountains. I can yeah. see, you know, all of it. Right. So, uh, you're out here, uh, you got a group that you're staying with. Um, what are some of the things you guys like to go out and do, you know, at these shows? Um, the vendor area is obviously super cool. There's a, a surprising amount of vendors that come here, um, which is awesome. As many as we can fit. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Limited to space. No, it's, uh, but, uh, I mean, we, we pretty much every day wake up, you know, do a day ride out, out to the beach and back. There's just so many different lines. Like you can't even explain to somebody. You could go ride the same area for like five days and hit a different line every single day. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a day ride and then a night ride, the night rides, uh, out here specifically are, <laughs> <laughs> they're it's a incredible. Different yeah. Yeah. If you get a chance, put some light bars on <laughs> yep. a couple lighted whips, make it sure is, you're well seen yeah, it and, is, uh, uh, take it the really first time, cool. take it easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I suggest if it's, if it's your first time out here at a night ride, do it early in the week <laughs> <laughs> before there's 600 cars out there all battling yeah. for first. Right. Uh, there are some choke points and some drop offs <laughs> that you will definitely need to know about. So, um, yeah, last year was pretty intense. And when I got out to, to, to film it, it was all foggy. And so you just saw this like beehive of lights <laughs> like coming through and it looked like aliens on the dunes. It's the craziest experience. So we uh, we tried to get in a night ride uh, on one of the guided night rides last year. Yeah. And somebody's glasses flew off and we lost them. And like it, it's that crazy that you can't get back in once you once you've pulled oh, off no, for an away, issue. Yeah. You're out. Like, it, it, I mean, you'll <laughs> die if you pull back in. <laughs> yeah. No, everybody's full pinned on, at that point. So. Uh, it's one of the, and even if you're not like an adrenaline junkie and looking for that experience, just going out to watch, to it. watch it is pretty a impressive. spectacle. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. There was, when we were out last time, uh, last year, there was whole families camping chairs, like barbecues, yep. and they were just all watching them come by. And the best part is they come by again. They come, you go, they yeah. go all the way North and then they come back South. So, yep. uh, it's, it's really a unique experience for sure. And it's not, Definitely. You, I've seen some night ride stuff at like Glamis and yeah. stuff. And it's cool, like it's it, seeing that happen out there is pretty cool. Um, but it's a different experience when you have such variation in terrain. Yes, and it's yep. not just bull, 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 bull. Right. 
Um, and uh, you can come out here and, and, and they're carving like through a narrow choke point, then they're doing a drop <laughs> off, and then they're doing a split that merges, yeah. and then they're doing a carve, and then they're, you know, it's exactly. It's, then you're hitting water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the so. diversity out here is, uh, you really got to experience it. Yeah. And everyone gives me crap online about, we always talk about the dunes. It was like, well, I mean, if I talked about the mountains every day, that would be kind right. of annoying. Sure, <laughs> so, sure. Um, but uh, do you ever go out in the mountains with your with your cars and, and enjoy the, the, the kind of that terrain Yeah, difference? so we we built a uh, Ranger North Star, which is like the full AC, heat, and cab. Um, and that thing is fully, like... That's like glamping on wheels. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, it's awesome. You could go on like a full dusty, you know, uh, fire road and yeah. like you're clean all the way there. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. So that's what uh, we've done a fair amount of mountain riding on that. And it's yeah, it's so much fun. So in Idaho, um, you have St. Anthony's, which is like all your go fast dune stuff. And then the other off road recreation is really where you could take a Jeep or a truck or anything. Right. So the, the North Star is a, is a ton of fun that way. And down in your area, there's a lot of um, just like canyony type stuff. It's not like real well treed or anything like that. Um, it is, so kinda, uh, you have you have some trees. And yeah, stuff, no, but. I mean, really, where you can drive is all like forest roads in. Uh, it's it's just a different area. But, yeah, yeah, it's just mountain mountain roads where you could take a pickup. Right. And the nice thing about Idaho is they do a pretty good job maintaining their trails, too. They do, so, yeah. So you're really not fighting the rocks and the, the right. ruts and stuff as right. much as you would like in Washington where we where we ride a lot there's you'll you'll just commonly just be having big chocks or chunks of rock oh, in the wow. way and, and r- hmm. ruts and washouts and stuff gotcha uh, it's not bad trails it's just yeah rougher yeah uh, and in yeah. idaho it's, it's almost like they come through with a street sweeper <laughs> <laughs> right well they get, no you're right but that that is the one downside is they are roads that they actually maintain right. so well it's idaho they use them that's right they live yeah. out there yeah, right right no <laughs> doubt so uh, uh, one thing I like to do is just kind of ask everybody. I mean, we're kind of midway into the year now, but uh, kind of looking forward to this rest of the year and, and maybe into spring. What are some of the things you're looking forward to either on your race program, uh, on the car, like how you're working towards building that for yeah. the end of the year? you got some new stuff coming out for, for race season in August. Yep. Um, kind of go through what you're looking forward to. Yeah, so um, at Hammers, we ended up uh, crashing a car, which... Um, Wait, that is Hammers. Yeah, crashing right. Cars. yeah, right. No, we <laughs> extra crashed this one. So that that was a bummer, but uh what the the cool silver lining of that was we I was able to rebuild it into a pre runner that is uh, just like my race car. So that's really so the, exciting. So the white and green car is your is your one that you crashed at. Hammers. Yeah, yeah. It's got a new new frame, you know, basically new everything. But uh, anyway, able the ability to build a pre-runner that is just like a race car is competitively an advantage. Right. And, uh, it's, it's like a, you were saying earlier, you're able to go trash this one before yeah, you get out with the race car. Yeah, and aside from that, it's so much fun. <laughs> 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 with a race car, you can't go beat on them too hard. It, it just doesn't make sense. But uh so uh, give us a rundown on that car. What's 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 the powertrain? What's the tune? What's the yeah? So it's a pro uh, twenty. It was a twenty twenty pro XP. <laughs> it's now a twenty two, um, and uh, it's got aftermarket assassin tune on it, and uh, just pretty mild because the whole deal in racing is is reliability, right? Um, Finishing. Yeah, you can't use all the horsepower all the time, right? So reliability. Any, uh, it's got an HCR long travel kit, uh, RCV axles. Um, HCR does kind of a special beefier kit for right. us to hold up to the rocks, which is rad. Um, so does that like thicker bottom plate and, and things yeah, like so that? Yeah, so they double plate the front of the A-arms. Yeah. Um, trailing arms are about the same, but it's just like, you know, p- recreation is like, oh, man, I hit that rock on accident. Ours is like, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I hit it at about 40. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to bounce that way, so yeah. I, I ricocheted off of that one. Yeah, so the other really fun part about that car is the, uh, the, the race-developed shocks on it um, are – a lot of notches. It's a whole different yeah. league. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 pretty cool. And that car is still live valve, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. So you're not only incl- you're not only fine tuning the the porting on it, the valving on it. You're fine tuning every aspect of every it. Every aspect. And then yep. when you throw on the suspension, electronic suspension changes. Yep. You're you're not only. Uh, amplifying what you had you're actually moving the category correct w- along yeah. with it yep yep so that's a that's a special opportunity that not everyone has so that's a really fun part of so the, what he's saying is got. if you can find the race series shock for sale <laughs> it's worth the uh, investment i yeah <laughs> guys are always like oh no race stuff's trashed i don't know <laughs> if there's shocks i would pick them up if they're not leaking <laughs> yeah right right 
No, so that's uh, yeah, we're and uh, so we built the pre runner, got that going, uh, resurrected what we could off the race car, and then I'm building a new race car that we'll have ready um, for our Ultra Four race in August. Um, that will be like boat sided, <clears throat> you know, solid side car, full one piece, um, basically super rigid, super yeah, safe. Yeah, a car to win King of the Hammers is really what we're going for there. But along with that, how we said reliability with power. Um, the the bar is being raised as we go, so I'm I'm gonna add quite a bit more horsepower to this car. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's just where where you're at to be competitive. So, uh, so when you really talk about the stuff. horsepower on the race car, there's a lot of um, kind of opinions on where that power should live. Sure. Right. A lot of guys are saying I need that instant power. I need to be able to take that torque right from the get go. Right. Some guys are like. It's fine where it's at there. I just need to make sure that when I'm up in that higher RPM range, I yeah. can pass the next guy, right? Yep. And so you have to tune your car differently for those two different those kind of approaches, right? Yep. And uh, where do you find yourself landing in that kind of that targeted power range? Yeah. So I see three categories. You have uh, short course racing, ultra four racing, and then desert racing. So in uh, short course, you know, obviously you you're, you need corner speed and then high speed, really. Right. Um, Desert has really no takeoff, not a lot of corner speed. They're just looking for high speed, keeping the belt temps low. Right. Um, and then Ultra 4, where it's unique, is you're – like, I in Moab, we have a race, and I literally completed three laps in low range. I didn't even go to high range. <laughs> That's That would never happen in any other race series right. ever. Um, so and, do you uh, find yourself shifting between low and high in Ultra 4 frequently? Yes. Yeah. For versus, the rock versus the other series where you're kind of just stuck in this one. For sure. Yeah. So the rock obstacles. Um, I mean, you really have to see them to wrap your head around it. In a, if, if as a recreation guy, you you wouldn't even square up to it and go up and over some of these obstacles. I mean, they are extremely intimidating. And when you see those drone shots from like the Ultra 4 media team, yeah. right? Like yep. it, it yeah, it looks kind of like the size of the car like ish. Yeah, but when you're standing next to you, you're like this is a house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no doubt. Yeah, the it, there's no scale on any of the cameras. I mean, that's what that's kind of the cool part and what I find really fun about Ultra 4 and what makes it unique is uh, the challenge of terrain that you have to drive is unbelievable. Right. Um, it's super cool. And at speed, right? Like, you're not trying to just... Yeah, there's no tiptoeing. <laughs> no. That's, that's what I mean by, like, uh, HDR suspension and RCV axles. I, I can't... Um, I, I wasn't previously running RCVs a, a couple years ago. I, I would come back with two and three broken axles every race, and we're doing yeah. all new axles every time, so... I mean, the like I can't. Even and you're deteriorating your capability as you do that yeah. through the race, right? I can't even explain the violence. <laughs> <laughs> to to be competitive is right. is ridiculous. Yeah, no, it, it it comes down to to having when I when I have people that come into the sport and they're they're just getting used to their UTV or whatever. I'm yeah. always telling them go out and just leave it in low, get to know your car, yep. work your way up, so that you and the car become one. Because in UTV, it's so easy. To, oh yeah, to not be one in it, the end pieces. Yeah, it will. So, it will give you a lot more than you're probably ready for. Right, and so in racing, I feel like a lot of times we miss that that perspective of yeah. spending that lap time, spending that that R and D time with your team, and getting to know your car so yep. super well. And um, especially when it comes down to, I, I'm always my mind's blown when these guys that race that race multiple classes. Like right. just how much acuity you have to have to know how the car individually on yeah. that class is going to handle, how to drive it, when to sacrifice, right. when not to sacrifice. Um, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, like I said, I'm not super like race nerdy, but yeah. when it gets down to like those types of things, yep. I love knowing the intricacies of all that. It's like when you talk about F1 cars or NASCAR, it's like sure. they're, they're just going in laps. Well, no, there's a lot going yeah. on in that guy's head. You right. Know? Yep. And I think that's super cool with like some of those like NASCAR and Indian. They're they're starting to integrate the driver conversations. They're starting to sure. integrate the team conversations. Like for UTV, I think that might be super cool to hear some of the banter back and forth. Yeah, on that. no, and it's I mean it's getting better. It's getting better every year. It's just kind of like a a budget. I mean a budget for support. You know, yeah. we're uh, as a racer, we're always trying to get as much support as we can. But I I think a bunch of companies. Um, you know, are jumping on board, and I think everybody's experience is getting better and better. So the the live stream of, of a bunch of series, but Ultra Four and Mid America specifically, is 
like second to none. It's incredible. Uh, yeah, the just the number of drones they're flying, sure. let alone yeah. everything else. Yep. Uh, and we were down at the Mint and seeing their production trailer and, and it going behind the scenes and all that stuff. Yeah. It's amazing how much work goes into that. People a lot of times just think racing is just drivers, teams, product, car, yeah. you know, that yep. stuff. And there's so much more that goes into an yep. experience, not only for the con for the fan, but for the teams that want to be there, right? Like yes. uh, a race team doesn't want to go race a race series where that track's not going to be hospitable, that's not going to have yeah. proper yeah. hookups that's not going to have the amenities that will you know provide them the experience that yep. they need right yep um and so when you talk about uh places that are running um like like we're in the the off-road syndicate trailer here and the, and they're part of the mid-america you know uh thing that's going on where they yep. took over the ultra four and yep. and that series and and you go to that location they're they're not holding back on no. keeping everybody well maintained right sure. like not only the fan that's on the bleacher yep or look for goodness sakes, watching a short course floating a lazy river. <laughs> Who, where else in the country can you do, or yeah. the world for that matter, can you I do that? Don't know. Yeah, I think um, that's it. <laughs> and uh, but they they're investing in the experience, not sure. just the racing. Yep. Right. And it goes for both sides, race teams and spectators. Yeah. And I think it's super important that you know, as of people that are involved with events, that they consider both sides of that. Sure. Because that's going to be ultimately what grows our sport even more than it is. And it's Definitely. going to be it's going to be a healthier growth, not just a, a big money coming in. Yeah, growth. yeah, yeah. Sustainable growth where uh, it's an event that everyone's willing to come to. And I think we're seeing the growth across the board. So hats off to really everybody in off-road. They're doing an awesome job, like you said, from spectators to participation to, uh, to industries jumping in, being involved. Right. And I think it's super important also to remember that there are other companies that are involved in these series, like like race. We've been talking about sponsorship lately on the podcast. Uh, we had Alex Dreiler on that's did, that did the off road um, uh, sponsorship sponsorship summit last week, and and a bunch of uh, special um, guests on that. And and, uh, and we've been talking about you know how can people get into racing? How can they get into sponsorships? And and because everybody's buying these cars and they kind of feel like racers, and then that usually yeah. evolves into well, shoot, I'm going to go out this weekend and throw throw down and see what yeah. happens, right? Yep. So you never know. Uh, and uh, I think it's super important that a lot of the growth in our industry has been supported by the smaller mom and pop shops, yep. by the smaller fab shops, the guys that are transitioning from, you know, diesel to UTV, you know, right. fabrication and performance or the yep. guys that are, uh, that have been doing automotive or trailer work and then they're moving into chassis work. Yeah. Or, you know, there's a lot of these little small companies that are local to the racers, uh, that can provide a lot of value to them if, yep. if they do their job on providing value back to those guys. Right. Right. Um, but the number of those shops, are what keeps us healthy in the right. economics of all this, sure. right? And there are big sponsorships. There are big companies that will be willing to get you across yep. the country, and it's easier for that to be the thing you want to go after. The goal, right. Right. But there's a lot of us that are smaller companies, smaller brands that all work together to make this healthy. Like, you come here to Tejo, right? There are big brands out here. Sure. But there's a lot of small brands. Right. And they, and they have a lot of impact in their communities. Yeah. And I think it's super important to not forget about those guys and not right. be, not just be throwing our money in Amazon, not just throwing right. our money at, you know, uh, whatever the cheapest price is or whatever. Yeah. And no, that's keep a good it, point. keeping our families, keeping our teams, keeping our right. our industry healthy at the organic level versus just always going for bottom dollar. Or, yeah. you know, you go on Facebook and you're like, hey, I need to get a part for this, whatever. <laughs> and then you're instantly followed up with like 10 guys. Like, yeah. DM me. I'll give you the cheapest price. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. That's not healthy. No, What's healthy is no. you're going out to your to your your businesses and, and supporting them and, and working with them to to have a good experience. Yep. Yep. That's uh yeah. I mean that that's the whole deal is you know you you may not have the the sticker on the side of your car that you want, but there's probably some local guys that will treat you a hundred times better. Yeah. Um and and oftentimes provide you better or you know the same or better support so yeah like you're saying so I, as a racer how how's that changed over the years like you you said you jumped in on with a zrp right yeah and zrp uh travis and all those guys have been super uh invested in that kind of like development yep. side of things right and yep. they, they're putting out great products that are high quality not chimping out yep um over the over the years as you've pulled sponsors into the program has have things changed at all have you seen any kind of trends over the last few years um, yeah, definitely. I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to anybody that's, you know, you look up to your mentors and who, who you who inspires you and who you want to be become. And uh, they've worked hard for what they've got. I mean, there's right. very few handouts. You know, people always say like, oh, they got so lucky. They got this. They know. I mean, it's every facet of who you are, you know, your success, your personality, you know, your presence, all of it plays into it. Um, so. As far as sponsorship goes, it's like just 
my deal is just try to be the best person I can be in every category. Right. Um, so that's, you know, I don't. Everyone asks, how do you get into racing, and you know, how do you get, how do you acquire sponsorship? Right. It's a tough deal. Everyone's road is it's, a little bit different. And it's kind of a chicken egg thing, right? Yeah. Like some people I've talked to is is it's not fake it till you make it, but it's it's definitely like try to be the best representat yeah, representation representation exactly. for the brands you are working with yep. or the people that you are working with or the people you want to work with sure. before they are working with you. Yeah. Well, and you've got to earn your wings. I mean, even if even if there was a guy that just got into it, he wouldn't uh, be mature enough in in all of racing to really maintain top level sponsorship it, uh, you you really got to grow into it uh from so i've been in it four years now and if i was just given what i've got today four years ago i would have messed it all up <laughs> <laughs> so uh certainly growing into your into your environment i think is important yeah. I, the skipping steps doesn't help it right. looks like it would i don't think <laughs> that it would help <laughs> So you got the new car coming uh, this fall. Uh, you're going to be racing in August. You're going to be hitting uh, hammers and all that yep. stuff. Um, is there anything else that you're looking forward to hitting? Uh, any kind of new challenges in, in racing or life that you're looking forward to? Uh, I mean, so really the challenge is, is just to get to all the events, man. Our schedule, oh my God. <laughs> our schedule is crazy. We, we've got a big event every single month, and they're spread out, you know, from uh, Mid-America Outdoors, um, you know, clear into Oklahoma. It's just the logistics of traveling, the, the time off, the money invested. Right. Um, that's our biggest hurdle. So we're trying to make as many events as we can because they're all a bunch of fun. Yeah, and, uh, and they're all and, spread out. <laughs> yeah, and still keep and still keep racing alive. So I mean, we're we're uh, living the dream. Super fortunate. Um, yeah, that's. I mean, what to look forward to is like the rest of the year. It's just <laughs> there's a ton of awesome <laughs> events. Awesome. So, so the uh, the pro R is uh, in the future, or or we're sticking with the. Uh, um, the no, it definitely is in the future. I've got a uh, turbo R in order. I've got a pro R in order. Um, the turbo R was my favorite car for last year. Like, sure. Just going into this year, I think that's like the car of the year because it has that kind of that middle, yep, the compromise in between both sides, right? Yeah, I I actually wish that I would have taken more interest to the turbo R because uh, I I kind of was so fixated on the pro R that I missed. The advantages to the, the advantages. turbo are, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I think that's a little bit of an underrated car for um, sure, especially in well, the and it, it, just the availability of it is yeah. near non-existent. Yeah, so. and then the classes um, actually work out a lot better for the right. turbo R. But no, there's a yeah. I I will have a a turbo a pro R built here at some point whenever I get it. So. <laughs> That's what everybody at home yeah, is all wondering where their right, orders are. Right. Uh, so anyways, we're at TakeOver. It's an, uh, it's Wednesday. It's the first day of the event, quote, right? quote. We, you've been here for a while. Yeah, I've uh, been here since Saturday. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I just want to stay here like for a month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, we're going to get out, get some ripping, uh, have a good show. You're going to stick around for uh, Willie Fest, Huck Fest, all that stuff? Yeah, yep. Those events are super fun to watch. Uh, I'm, I'm debating whether or not to enter the car into the show short course it just looked like so much fun last year so i don't know we'll see <laughs> it is it's a lot of fun especially even i mean you watched it last year yeah it was, it, the, the course was fast and then it had some ups and downs and yeah uh, the, the hillside carves were always fun uh no you should do it just just to have the fun of doing it sure right? so yep. i mean how often do you get a short course set up in a sand dune for right. you to go rip who gets yeah. other guys yeah uh and we got some good racers out there right like we got white hastings one of my buddies that for just, sure he's fast kid he's man very fast. fast yep and uh and so it's a lot of fun to watch to do it and that's the best thing about this this type of show right yep. you can get out here and do it it's not you're going to a vendor row and going home it's yeah it's, you can do and participate in literally all of it yeah, yeah it's a bunch of fun like everybody mom can do it you Cur can do yep. it yep <laughs> yep and that's actually there was uh there was some barrel racing last year and there was this little grandma and literally Literally, grandma. I'm not like <laughs> trying to be mean. <laughs> sure. literal, literal grandma with her kids on the side, her grandkids on the sideline. So in, good. In her little uh, pioneer. And she was out throwing down on barrel races. Yes. It was so awesome. <laughs> and doing good, too. Like, she That's wasn't slow. Awesome. So, anyways, cool. uh, we're at the show. We're having a good time. Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I appreciate you the invite. Out. Yeah, it's been a good time. Uh, hope to see you out there. And uh, for everybody else uh, online, you can find us on Spotify, YouTube. You can find us on uh, Apple, Google Podcasts, all the different places. And uh, we would appreciate a good rating if you thought – if you thought Jake's teeth were white enough. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> throw us a five star on, on Apple if you can. Uh, uh, but until the next time, guys, peace.